Hey everyone, so today is Tuesday, April 7th, and we are looking at A Midsummer Night's Dream. Yesterday you read Act 1, so today in this video, this video will be pretty brief. We're just going to go over a couple key components from Act 1 that I want to make sure you recognize when you're reading, and then I'm also going to talk about the character map you should be doing later today. Okay, so first things first, if you guys will turn to Act 1 with me, so we're on page 7. And yesterday in Monday's video, one of the things I talked about was the summaries, the summaries that are at the beginning of each different scene. I do encourage you to read those. They are there to help you. So make sure you're looking at those. So this gives you a brief outline of what you read in Act 1, Scene 1. And so also as you're reading again, make sure you're paying attention to stage direction, excuse me, stage directions who's entering, and that will also help you keep up with what's going on. Um, so at the very beginning, you see, so it says, Theseus, Duke of Athens, he's planning the festivities for his upcoming wedding to the newly captured Amazon, Hippolyta. And so on page 7, I just want to make sure you guys understand. So Theseus and Hippolyta are having a bit of a back-and-forth exchange, and in doing so... Theseus says, oh, I can't wait to marry you in just four days, but it's going so slowly, right? He says he's upset, and Hippolyta is basically like, she says, four days will quickly steep themselves in night, and essentially what she's saying here is basically, well, it's going to come quickly enough. So she is not too excited to marry him, and we understand that at the bottom of page seven with what Theseus says. So Theseus says, Hippolyta, I wooed thee with my sword, and won thy love, doing thee injuries, and I will wed thee in another key, with pomp, with triumph, and with reveling. And so here, Theseus basically admits that he won her purely, um, sort of by violence, right, by capturing her, and so now he's going to make her his queen, and so she obviously didn't have any kind of choice in the matter. Um, so that gives you some background for the Duke of Athens and his soon-to-be wife. Next, we're introduced to Aegeus and his daughter Hermia. And so Aegeus comes in and he says, I've got a huge problem, right? He says, I want my daughter Hermia to marry Demetrius. However, Lysander over here, he seems to have stolen her heart, right? And so he comes to the Duke of Athens. He comes to Theseus and he says, basically, I want you to give her two options. And so if you look at the bottom of, uh, let's see, page 11, he uh, tells Hermia, basically, okay, Hermia, here's what your dad wants. As the Duke of Athens, I'm going to give you two options. And so on page 11, down at the bottom, the first two lines that Theseus says, he says, either to die the death or to abjure forever the society of men. And so essentially what he's saying here is, okay, you have two choices. You can either die and not fulfill your father's request or you can become a nun, right? So those are your two alternatives should you not choose to marry Demetrius like your father wants. All right, and then moving on, so let's go on to page 15. If you look down on the bottom of page 15, so this is an important line, line 136. It says, the course of true love never did run smooth. And so hopefully some of you guys have heard this line before. This is actually a really famous line, the course of true love never did run smooth. So I just wanted to point that out to you if you never heard that before. It's a very famous Shakespeare line. Let's see, what else? Okay, so then down on page 17. So everybody leaves, Hermia and Lysander, they're left, just the two of them. And uh, Hermia is really upset and Lysander says, okay, look, I have a plan, right? So his plan Make sure you're noting this is on the bottom of page 17. He says, okay, here's what we're going to do, right? He says, I have a widow aunt of great revenue, and it says she doesn't have any children. Her house is far from Athens, right? It's seven leagues from Athens. Um, and he says, there, Hermia, I can marry you, right? He says, there, we can get married, and the Athenian law won't touch us. He says, everything will be great. That's what we'll do. Um, so he comes up with a plan for the two of them. And she says, okay, great, sounds good, but the next thing you know, here comes Helena. And uh, hopefully you noticed Helena has already been mentioned, and she's been mentioned specifically about, or I guess uh, Lysander mentioned her when he was referencing Demetrius. So on page 13, if you flip back, Lysander calls out Demetrius, and he says, Demetrius is not as good of a guy as you think he is. He's talking to Theseus. He says, actually, Demetrius made love to Helena, right? So he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You want her to marry Hermia, 
He's talking to Theseus and therefore also commenting to Aegeus. He says, you want Hermia to marry Demetrius, but in reality, Demetrius has already had a thing with Helena. And so they don't comment on that just yet, but in comes, on page 19, in comes Helena, and uh, they basically start talking to her, they figure out what's going on, and what we learn here on page 19 is that Helena wants to be Hermia. So if you look at this exchange on the bottom of page 19, Helena comes in and she says, call you me fair, that fair again unsay. She says, oh, Demetrius loves your fair. And so she goes on and on. And basically what she does here, she's commenting on Hermia's eyes, her voice, right? She goes on, she's talking about all her different characteristics. And she says, oh, how come I can't be you? She says, Demetrius loves you, right? And so what we find out here is Helena actually really has a thing for Demetrius. So interesting, right? Starting this uh, unusual love triangle. Um, and so then from there, so we've got the plan and then they start talking to Helena. Helena keeps complaining. She's like, oh, Hermia, I just want to be you. But then at the very end, Lysander and Hermia, they tell Helena their plan to get married, right? Hermia's like, okay, look, Helena, please stop complaining. We are going to get married. You can have Demetrius, right? She's like, you can have him all to yourself. I don't want anything to do with him. And so uh, at the very end, on page 23, at the end of scene one of act one, Helena is left on stage alone. And so at the very bottom, this is line 252, she says, I will go tell him of fair Hermia's flight. Then to the wood will he tomorrow night pursue her. And for this intelligence, if I have thanks, it is a dear expense. And so essentially what she's thinking, she's like, okay, they're going to go run off. Here's what I'll do. So that's their plan, right? They're going to run off. Here's me, Helena. My plan is I'm going to tell Demetrius, and hopefully as a thank you, right, he will want to be with me. He'll be sad that Hermia's left, and as a thank you, he'll remember, oh, actually, I did have this thing with Helena once. Maybe I'll just be with her, right? Um, and so that is the end of scene one. So the couple things I hit on there that you should be able to answer on your own that I just discussed. So first, Theseus gives Hermia two options. What are they? So she has the option to, demarry, to marry Demetrius. If she does not, what are her other two alternatives? It's on the bottom of page 11. And then the second thing I pointed out was the famous Shakespeare line on the bottom of page 15. Make sure you star that. Third thing, what is Lysander's plan for himself and Hermia? So what is their plan specifically? Not just, you can't just say, oh, they're going to run away. What is their plan specifically? That's on the bottom of page 17. And then lastly, what is Helena's plan? And that is on the bottom of page 23. So make sure you're familiar with those things that I just discussed. If you have other questions, if you felt like anything else was confusing in scene one, feel free to email me. So let's move on to scene two. So scene two, again, if you read the summary at the beginning, it gives you an idea of what you're about to read. So it says, six Athenian tradesmen decide to put on a play called Pyramus and Thisbe for Theseus and Hippolyta's wedding. So we've got tradesmen, right? So tradesmen, if we remember from our previous studies, they are basically merchants, and they are going to put on this play in order to celebrate their duke, right? In order to celebrate the Duke of Athens being married and having having a wife. And so basically in scene two, we meet all these different characters. They've got really funny names and that's purposeful. So Shakespeare here is uh, putting in some comedy or put, uh, excuse me, adding in some humor and it's supposed to be funny. And so while you're reading scene two, hopefully you took away a couple things. Um, so first what you want to gather is basically the role that each of the characters play. So Quince here, Quince is sort of the director. He's in charge, but then bottom he also thinks he's in charge. So he, the way I would have you think about Bottom is a bit of a drama queen. He essentially wants to play every part in the play. And so what I would ask you to do on your own is see if you can find an example of that. So there's several different examples in Act 2. I'll give you one at the top of page 29. So one character is a lion in this play, Pyramus and Thisbe, that the players are going to perform one of the characters is a lion, and so the lion gets assigned, but then Bottom jumps in on the top of page 29, and he says, let me play the lion too. I will roar that I will do any man's heart good to hear me. And so he's basically saying, oh, I'll do a good job, right? I can do a really good job being a lion. Watch my lion roar, basically, is what he's saying, right? Um, and so with Bottom, just understand he wants to play every part. So even though Quince is the one basically distributing all the different parts to the various players, 
Bottom comes in, wants to play every role, even though he's already been given the main role. Okay, and then next. So this is pretty short, straightforward scene. The other thing I wanted to ask from scene two was where are they going to practice and why? So Quince distributes all the different parts and then they come up with a plan. So this is on the bottom of page 29 now. And he says, uh, by tomorrow night, this is line 97, he says, meet me in the palace wood a mile without the town by moonlight. There will we rehearse, for if we meet in the city, we shall be dogged with company and our devices known. And so essentially he says, okay, we are going to go out into the woods. This is where we're going to practice our play because otherwise everybody would be listening and we want it to be a surprise for the wedding. So that is uh, um, the very end of scene two. Very short, very brief. Just to recap scene two. So first, what are they doing? Who are the players? They're putting on this play. What is it called? Make sure you know those things. And then second... So remember who the different characters are. The main characters you want to be familiar with are Quince and Bottom. The other characters are kind of minor. Um, they will come into play in the character map I'm going to talk about in just a second. But in terms of your overall understanding, make sure you have a clear understanding of Bottom and Quince. The other players, Flute, Snug, etc. They're more minor. Again, they'll be in the character map, but not a big deal for the play as a whole. And then lastly... Where are they going to practice and why? So where are the players going to practice? Think about where all the characters from Act 1 are also going, right? Where are Lysander and Hermia going? Helena has a plan to tell Demetrius, so likely she thinks that he will follow them. So where are all these people going to be after Act 1? That's something I want you to be thinking about. Okay, so those were a couple of key things from Act 1, Scenes 1 and 2. Again, if you have questions, feel free to email me. Hopefully you're starting to see how this is going to be fun, right? There's some, you know, kind of silly names and a love foursome, perhaps, if you want to call it that, um, that seems to be forming. So make sure you're picking up on those things. Continue to annotate and take notes as we're doing this. And then jot down a couple of the questions, a couple of things I mentioned in this video today. The other thing I wanted to touch on now you should do after you watch this video is fill in the character map. So this is on the daily agendas. This is four. So four says read act two of A Midsummer Night's Dream. So that's the first thing you're going to do after you watch this video. You're going to go read act two. Again, annotate, take notes, make sure you're aware of what's going on. After you read act two, I would like you to fill out the character map. So this is for A, letter A on the daily agendas, and it says complete the character map. Even if you don't have a printer, I would highly suggest that you go ahead and write out the character map on a sheet of paper. So the character map is going to be super helpful keeping everybody straight. Like I said, there's a lot of characters. You haven't even been introduced to all of them currently while you're watching this video. After you read Act 2, of course, you'll be set to fill out the character map. But there are a lot of characters, and this will help you keep it straight. So in the Daily Agendas, it's on a Google Doc. You will not be able to edit the Google Doc if you copy and make a copy of it. Does that make sense? You know, on Google Docs, how you can go to file, make a copy. If you make your own individual copy, you might be able to edit it, but I'm not sure because it's an image. And so what I would suggest is you just print it off and handwrite the names into the character map. And again, if you don't have a printer, then you can just fill it in. You can draw the arrows in the boxes just on a sheet of notebook paper. You can do it yourself. You don't need the actual character map. But this is for your benefit. So I'm not going to necessarily be collecting the character map. You're not going to turn it into me for a grade. When we did this in school, I had the students do it for a quiz grade, but that's, of course, difficult to do online. So this is really just for your benefit, but I'm asking you to do it. So please, on your honor, do it. It will help you learn the characters. And that's pretty much it for today. So we covered Act 1. If you need anything else that you would like reviewed, let me know. And then uh, the character map after you read Act 2 is it for today. So I think that's about it. If you have questions, email me. Sorry I'm being repetitive. I feel like there should be something else, but I think that's about it. So anyways, till tomorrow. See you then.